Welcome to another episode of the Odyssey Podcast. My name is Jeremy Lally. I'm the host of the show. This is an Ithaca Media podcast. Um, our guest today, uh, I, again, I say this all the time, but I say special guest, but this is very genuine because um, this guest happens to be my father. It's Patrick Mullally, and he's the um, founder and owner of Work Claims Australia. So I'm going to have to call you Patrick for the episode, which is going to be quite weird, but I'll do that. So <laughs> welcome to the, the podcast, Patrick. Thanks oh, for coming in. Yeah, very glad to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so for those who uh, may not know you, can you explain uh, who you are and uh, what Work Claims Australia is as well? Well, starting with the second part of your question, Work Claims Australia is a specialist boutique industrial advocacy firm. Uh, we fill a space in the, in the legal arena where uh, parties are involved in industrial relations disputes particularly at the employment level. Trade unions tend to fill the space where there's the broader issues about awards, EBAs and rates of pay. Um, but we concentrate on the individuals and um, also small employers uh, experiencing uh, difficulties with respect to their employment relationships or uh, enforcement of um, uh, rights and obligations under the appropriate legislation or industrial instrument. So that's what Work Claims Australia does. Uh, from my own personal point of view, um, I've come through a legal career um, spanning back, I think, to the um, early 70s and uh, have been the last um, 20 or 30 years uh, working in the industrial advocacy space as an industrial advocate. Yeah, right, okay. And before we go on, I, like, this is, just so you know, this is the first episode I've ever worn a, a blazer on. All right. And, and like I said before, the only reason I'm doing it is because I didn't want to feel underdressed. So, okay. <laughs> you've, come, you've come dressed very sharp today, so. Well, thank you. I I took your advice and tried to look casual, but not overdressed. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the exact words I used were something to the effect of um, how, how a politician likes to dress when he's going on the radio. Something like that. Did I say something like that? You did indeed, yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, going on the radio these days is going on television as well, so yeah, usually. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah, when these days podcasts like we are today. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there you go. So yeah, you were touching on it then, but I want to go back to, I guess, your first experience from your interest in whether we call it law or, or justice, because I know you've got a story back when you were, because um, you, you did actually um, serve time in the army. Can you talk a bit about that experience and a bit about that story behind uh, that sort of initial instance of, of the, I guess, the, the brush with the law, like sort of yes. understanding of it anyway? Yeah. Well, initially when I um, finished high school, as it was called then, I don't know whether it's still called high school, but um, I uh, in those days you... Uh, going to university was quite competitive and uh, I managed to, I was brought up in the country as, on a farm and I managed to get a place at university to uh, study um, dentistry. And of course dentistry uh, it required a fair amount of biological science to start with. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and then the Menzies government introduced conscription and it had a, a very novel way of selecting the participants of those who would join the army. It was by was a lottery. It Did was you, by yeah. uh, lottery of your birthday. Yeah. And my marble came out. Um, I was born on the fourth of February, and for some reason that was chosen. And um, so at that time, it was quite uh, absolutely a, a, probably a shock, particularly to my parents and family, to think well. You know, you've been, you, you haven't chosen to go into the forces. My father had been and served in the Second World War, but he chose to do that. It was voluntary. Yeah. Um, had it ever been on your mind, like given that you're your? No, I had never, I never, never given the military a thought. No, yeah. and he'd, he'd never, he'd never um, encouraged it. Encouraged it, really. Yeah. No, he he'd, he'd, he told a few stories of, of his history and where he served. He served yeah. in the Middle East. Uh, he was a, a sapper, which is really an engineering role, and he was in, involved in very dangerous activities of diffusing mines, um, mm. which was you know, quite a hair-raising story, as he'd, he'd actually tell about that. Mm. But no, he'd never encouraged me to go to the military. 
So it was a shock, and um, yeah. we had to make a decision with would I complete my degree, which had another two, probably two years, two and a half years to go, or whether we, whether I would answer the the call up. You you were allowed to be deferred if you were studying. That's what I was going to ask. How much time did you? Yeah, you, you, it just you could, to finish your studies. You could no. finish your studies yeah. completely. Yeah, because had you started at this point and just been accepted. To yeah, no, I started. I'd, I'd started, done uh, I'd yeah. done a couple of years at uni. And, oh, you already done a couple of years. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and. So, you know, and I was at a point where I wasn't exactly enchanted by what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't really cut out to be a biological scientist. Mm. Um, and so I wasn't, wasn't all that thrilled with it. So I thought, no, I think I'll, I'll do the two years and see how, how my life so unfolds from, from yeah. there. So, um, um, yes, I did that. That was in um, 1964. I first started to, um, well, I think the following year, 65. My number was 6410573. That was my military number. So, uh, oh, and that's based on the, the on year on the that year, you listed. Yeah, the first year. Okay, that's yeah. when you were pulled out of the barrel. Right. And um, so in the Army, uh, obviously, you do basic training, and I went to officer training school and um, going to rank. I was a second lieutenant, um, which is a bit lower than a first lieutenant. First lieutenant is the usual regular army, but we were sort of uh, a little bit, um, they were discriminatory a little bit about us because we had very short training right. compared with Duntroon, which was the big big training college then, and they, they would do two years. So they made us second lieutenants. We only did four months, I think, of training. And so we were let loose into the into the um, army. We would get, I was given a, uh, a unit uh, at Albury, Wodonga, which is on the, the border of New South Wales and Victoria, yeah. and actually served out my time there. I didn't uh, go overseas to Vietnam, where that was the destination of mm. a fair number of those who were um, called up. Yeah. Um, and during that time, uh, particularly during training, um, I became very aware of uh, a sort of a very doctrinaire um, system of of justice within the army, and uh, you know there are various rules that if were broken, you were punished appropriately by early morning rises and runs up hills with full pack, right? So forth and so yeah. on. Does that include yourself? You have to do that a couple. Uh, times? Well, I had the uh, unique privilege of leaving training, owing them, um, <laughs> owing them some penalties. And you still haven't paid it off. I still haven't paid it off. No, and it was a pretty, it was a pretty interesting run. You go up. There's a big hill behind, a black hill behind yeah. the. And this is when you camp. say full gear. Like, what does that mean? Is that, oh, that like you've got a it? Full pack, your rifle. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Army boots. Uh, your full, you know, full pack was full of food and yeah. uh, pans and dishes and uh, digging tools and all sorts. It was quite heavy. Um, so and but then I started to get interested in how. Um, you know how formal charges would be laid against military personnel. Okay. Um, and it's all combined in one book, like a Bible, called the MBI, the Military Board Instructions. So the Military Board, seated in Canberra, they'd have a bunch of lawyers drawing up these these rules and regulations, which all the military had to follow. Mm. And so I had the I probably I understand from my captain that I was probably the only person that had ever asked. And I said, "Well, where's this book?" I want to see it. And they sort of um, got quite arced up about it. I said, well, no, I don't think you can. I said, well, because I got asked to help someone who's in trouble and I could go to his hearing, um, sort of like a support person, as we know today. But, yeah. said, but I help, you know, they sort of tried to have procedural fairness that you can get someone to come with you. Yeah. So they picked me and I said, well, I don't know much about legal stuff. Um, at that stage, I'd done some journalism in my spare time when I was at uni. Yeah. That's another story. But um, so I asked for the MBI and uh, um, eventually they, the, the, the judge sitting said, yeah, you've got to give it to him. He's asking for it. He's entitled to have it. So they gradually got it out and uh, had an adjournment while we compared the charge sheet with the particular uh, MBI. And some of them yeah. are very broad, very broad. And you got charged uh, as an offence. Yeah, and what type what type of offences would you kind of be looking at at this at this level? Like, at, like oh, the, the, well, just one that springs to mind would be insubordination to okay. a superior officer, which is yep. 
you know, all this saluting that goes on and, you know, yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, you've probably heard that. Yeah. Um, that was treated pretty seriously and you mm. could be locked up for, yeah, well. you know, for a couple of days in solitary. Yeah. Which is not very pleasant, you know, just get bread and water, basically. Mm. Um, so it, it was a, but the, the court system tried to be, they had a, a, a visiting lawyer, I think, who was uh, in the army, but he'd sit in as the judge advocate and yeah. have a couple of military guys with him. Um, so that was where it started. I started digging into the, you know, the, how it's formulated, where's your source of power, uh, you know, is this is this this really something you can charge him with? And eventually, one of my captains said to me, he said, you know, have you done law? I said, no. He said, well, you should. You should go and do it. I mean, you've got a, you seem to have an aptitude for digging into things and so forth. I said, oh, no, I've never been. I mean, lawyers are people who try and get guilty people off. He said, no, no. He said, you know, there's a, you know what you're driving at, because I think he had a bit of a legal background if he was working in that area. Right. Um, he said, no, I think you should go and do law. So when I finished my two years in the army, I enrolled at uni. Yeah, so it was it was his advice that basically, you, you yeah. made the decisions that you were going basically to do Basically it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, and, uh, yeah, I thought about what he... And, and I think he, he sort of recast the role of not just being this narrow thing that, you know, people come in who've committed a crime and to try and get them the less penalty or get them off altogether. Mm. It was broader than that, you know, the, the, the source of power, the source of the power of the state to, um, you know, to impose certain things on, on individuals and citizens. Okay, yeah. And so before we get to where you are with, with work claims, because that's obviously a very specified area of law, which is based ultimately around employment law, can you kind of touch briefly on, because you... You know, through your studies and then through your, your your legal career as well, you've seen other areas of law. Can you touch on those areas that you have seen and things that have interested you in those those areas? Yes. Um, in my younger days, uh, I commenced my legal career in a fairly large firm in Perth. Um, one of the establishment type firms. They actually headhunted me from uni, mm. which I was quite surprised about because I. And in those days, you had to do articles, which is a two-year sort of indenture, like an apprentice. Even though you've got your degree, you think you know the world, but you actually know nothing. Um, so you get an um, article to somebody, um, and they headhunted me, and I was uh, the article clerk to a um, one of the senior partners in Parker and Parker. His name was Tony, the late Tony Davy. He's passed away now, but. He was uh, a very interesting character. He he came from a farming background. Uh, so you would have had some commonalities. So we had a lot of commonalities. Yeah. And he had a farm. Um, he lived in Peppermint Grove and he used to say, I don't know why people think that Peppermint Grove is, is so fancy. You know, it's only another piece of real estate. And I used to say, Mr. Davey, but it, it's it's worth a lot of money where you live. <laughs> and he said, oh, really? <laughs> so he came from a very wealthy background. But but, but it wasn't a point of ignorance of, yeah, like the, of how, how wealthy he was. Maybe, yeah, he you know? just, yeah. It, it didn't sort of... Didn't face him, yeah. No, he couldn't understand why I shouldn't make him any different because yeah. he was an ordinary sort of guy. Yeah. Um, and I heard later much, much later that he really smoked himself to death. He got lung cancer and, and died. But, um, yeah, so he was um, my, my men, my, my, he was my, what do you call them then in those days? Um, Effectively was, a mentor. Yeah, yeah, a mentor in the yeah, legal yeah. sense, yeah. And, that, yeah. and that firm was really um, mainly a, a fairly large commercial firm. They had clients like the banks uh, in the days before banks had their own legal departments. Um, you know, banks and big mining companies would all, all come to Parker and Parker. And Parker and Parker no longer exists. It's been sort of submerged into various other big firms uh, with long-winded names down the terrace nowadays. Um, when I moved from Parker's, I left Parker's um, after I did the article for State about two years, and then I worked, I got a... Um, a position with the um, predecessor of Synergy. I was a legal officer at Synergy with another legal officer from the Crown Law Department, a gentleman called Arthur Charlton. 
is now deceased as well. But he was um, he was a great mentor uh, on on government law, and uh, he he had a lot to do with the rewriting of a new legislation. And I remember lots of times we de debated um, the right of the State Energy Commission to acquire land because they needed to put power lines through people's property. And there was always, particularly big farming areas down the southwest with very valuable land, people didn't want power lines through their property. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, so it became a bone of contention because he was very much uh, in favour of the citizen. He said, you know, we can't just take their land willy-nilly. The, the, the engineers in the SEC, as it was shortly called, um, they, they were quite content to just trample on people's land and you know, put up their poles and say, well, you know, this is a public good, you know, so we're putting power into these areas. Sometimes the people of the land weren't getting the power at all, but there it was. So that that was another phase um, where I got exposed to probably government law um, and the way the political system works uh, with respect to the legal system. Um, many times I sat outside the minister's office in Parliament House um, waiting to give him a response to a briefing note. Um, and uh, the minister in my time was a gentleman called Andrew Minsaris. Um, he was Polish background and he had a very, um, uh, what could I call it, a, a very short fuse, but he, he, want, <laughs> he, he was very good to me. He never, never criticised me, but he, he wanted it in very short, he wanted the answers to be short. You know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on my feet, Patrick. He would say, and I'd say, no, that's all right, sir. <laughs> I've, I've cut it right back. I said, but we've got a bigger note if you need it. I said, oh, that's a good idea. Now. Thank you for that. You know. So that was the way the, the ministerial flowed down to, so someone might can make, make a complaint to the minister about something, and so he'd funnel it down to the SEC, and they'd immediately give it to the legal department. Yeah, There's only two of us. You'd deal with it. We'd deal with it. He would be the one responding. So I, I was dispatched up to sit at Parliament House and yeah. wait till he answered the question or... Um, yeah, the questions on notice sometimes were hard too because they wanted a quick turnaround. Yes, they were expected to come back within 24 hours and so we'd be, you know, up, up and down. So that, that gave me an insight into government law and the political process. And then... Um, in my own, uh, I practice privately, so one, you know, when you're doing general um, law, you get a lot of um, maybe criminal stuff, maybe uh, family law stuck in my brain as well as mm. being a, a, an area of great interest because it was sort of emotional and immediate needs and, and so forth. Yeah. And um, that's probably where I started the employment relationship law as well. Yeah, well, that's what I asked. Like, why? What made you land on on that, and why? Why do you continue to? I guess really, I guess what's your passion for it? Because it, it seems like there's something that uh, sort of intrinsic to what you enjoy about doing it, which keeps you in that. Well, in I that think area. The, the best way of looking at that in in the the realms of human endeavour is that the employment relationship is stands probably equal with your personal relationship, either marriage or partnership or whatever the personal life you have, um, they're, they're probably of equal importance because if you lose your job, it's like having a divorce. That's how I find it. And, and the great majority of the challenges is when um, the employer wants to terminate the employment. And that can happen to someone who's been there for three months and it can be very devastating because they consider that they've left their old job to come to the new one. And for some unknown reason, the new employer doesn't want to keep going and wants to end the relationship. It's a bit like you know, the first courtship when someone says, look, we're having a great time. And then suddenly uh, I don't want you anymore. And it's just devastating. So you look at in the employment relationship, you start to delve into whether there is a legal basis for not continuing. It's not just once you form it, um, the overall rules are that you can't just end it at a whim. Even if it's on probation, we often say that you know you still do have some rights of protection, uh, although they're pretty slim because the probation period is, these days is designed to give the employer and, and the employee um, the opportunity to, to assess whether, like the interview process, whether I'm, I'm fitted for this. 
So there's a lesser chance there, but there'll be employment relationships that last for years and years, 20 years, 30 years. I've, I've got cases at the moment of 20 and 30 years where suddenly it's come to an end. And it might be because of a change in management, change in policies, and the, the employee is still going along the same old path that they were on, mm. not, not trained properly by the new management, not educated properly, maybe there's an age discrimination creeping in. Um, you know, maybe there's there's some mental issues for the, the old employee who's, you know, getting worn out, getting worn down. So there's all all sorts of challenges, legal challenges grow in the employment space. And, and it's evolving all the time. Um, to give you an example of that, um, for years and years, the various tribunals have been developing uh, some what we call common law principles to figure out whether someone is an employee. Because often the relationship is ill-defined and employers tend not to want to be uh, saddled with uh, entitlement issues such as leave, annual leave, long service leave, all those sorts of things. So they say, you're designated a contractor. And sometimes that's put in writing and signed up by the employee as well. But historically, um, the tribunals devised a way of figuring out whether there was a relationship of employment and, and defining that and saying, no, you're entitled to entitlements. The High Court in the last two years has turned that on its head and said in two particular cases, and one was Rosato, um, that was the first one, and the second one uh, earlier this year, 2022, decided that the task of the tribunals below the High Court uh, is to decide what was the agreed contract at the start of the relationship. Mm -hmm. You're not to take into account how it developed. So, in other words, in Rosato's case, it was an argument about whether he was casual uh, or actually a permanent employee. He'd been there for, I think, 12, 15 years. Um, and he was f described as casual, but he worked full time, year in, year out. Mm. And the High Court said, do we look at the original contract? He's casual. That's what it means. Now, the Albanese government, which has just been elected, has promised to have a look at this and revisit the realistic approach to protecting employees. Because with all due respect to the High Court, they they didn't take into account the imbalance of power between the employer and, and the employee. employee. Yeah, there's a, big, there's a big disparity and the, there. And the other thing that they didn't take into account was that these cases were in fact with labour hire companies. And I have a particular issue with labour hire companies because they are used by the big employers, and I won't name names, but there's a, a, a range of mining companies who employ thousands of people who always commence the employment with a labour hire company and essentially just try out the employee for a period of maybe six to 12 months. And if you're okay by the employer's standard, the labour hire company gets a fee to transfer you to the books of the employer. But in that interim period, at any time that the host employer, that is say the mining company where you're working, and most individuals consider that's their employer. When they go to work for the mining company, that's who they're working for, mm. and their boss tells them what to do and where to turn up to, what toolbox meeting to go to. Um, so they look to them as being their employer. If their employer says to them, don't come to work tomorrow, we've had enough of you, you're finished. The, the, the reaction is, and I've just, just dealt with one last week, the reaction is, well, you've, you've dismissed me and there's no reason for it. What I did was quite correct. It was a safety issue and I reported it, but now you've turned it on me to say that I breached the rules by mm. going into a certain area of the plant, which apparently he hadn't done. But he had no redress against the person who had sacked him, in his eyes, his employer was the labour hire company. So when he took action against the labour hire company, which is the only action he's got, um, they said, well, it's outside our control. We, we, we've still got work for you. Don't worry, we'll find you another job. 
Um, but the, dealing with the issue of why he was, he said, I've never been terminated in all my life and I'm now 56 and I've started at 16, so I don't want that on my record. Mm. Um, so the labour hire company is, is really sheltering the big employer from the realities from in, in of, a way, yeah, yeah, the, of the Fair yeah. Work Act yeah, yeah. and the rights to not be dismissed unfairly. Yeah, okay. But I sort of want to go back to, um, I guess, what in all of this, um, you know, it being a complex kind of area, what, what, what you kind of enjoy most about what it is you do? Um, the ability to bring a person who, on day one of the dismissal, is angry, distressed, uh, worried about the family, worried about paying the mortgage, worried about getting another job, um, just to name a few things, and, and being really angry about what's happened. And the, the, the principle guy, the, the guiding principle under the Fair Work Act is, was there a valid reason for this dismissal? And then on top of that, was it procedurally fair? They're, they're the two main areas that we have to look at. Um, the ability to guide that person, and, and the other thing is that they must take action if they want to have an unfair dismissal case within three weeks of the dismissal. And that three weeks is pretty tumultuous for a lot of people. Um, there are provisions where it can be, the time can be extended, but they're called, except they have to be exceptional circumstances. And the Fair Work Commission, and supported by full benches of the Fair Work Commission, have made that a very stringent test. You, you, you really got to tell people that if you don't do it in 21 days, you're going to be struggling to do it later on. So during that 21 days, they're usually concerned about how's the money going to be? Uh, am I getting any money from the old employer? Uh, do I be paid out some notice perhaps, or their annual leave which has accrued? So they've got a bit of cash to go on with. So they're not really focusing on redress at this stage. Mm. So time can tick by. But once once I do get them or we get them in, um, it's the, the ability to guide that, to get the... The, the application going and hopefully get to a point where it can be resolved by conciliation and you can dictate an outcome then which is essentially clears their name, gives them a bit of compensation perhaps, but enables them to move on and get another job without any scar on their on their background. Mm. I, I think that that really is, and then of course if it doesn't resolve the, the ability to take it further, to have it argued before a tribunal uh, initially, the Fair Work Commission, and then, in very rare circumstances, if you if you face an uh, an unjust outcome, uh, and it uh, is appealable, you have the right to appeal to a full bench, and that that is a very again another stringent test. It's, it's meant to be the rare case which gets to a full bench. Mm. And all, Although you, all think, you seem to see a lot of them somehow. So. <laughs> well, I, I do I do get there sometimes, but yeah. um, it, it's a good. It's a good feeling to be able to get someone to a full bench and have their their rights restored and um, the right outcome achieved. Yeah, yeah. Well, can we talk about that? Because I mean, for for a lot of these people, they like you said, some people have never even been dismissed in their life, and they're they're really um, the the power dynamic in this situation. A lot of the time, the the odds are stacked against them, and they they don't even feel like. Uh, pursuing it just because they feel like it's you know that it's like a david and goliath situation um i guess how do you sort of feel being in that situation and being on uh these people on their side to, to help them through that situation well um there's a great feeling on our part that we we tip the scales to at least in a balanced position because you're right the, the power imbalance is is huge particularly when they're going through the the dismissal process, mm. um, that becomes readily evident to them. They they will be required, if it's, if it's being done properly, they'll be required to show cause why they shouldn't be dismissed. And many of them feel that they, whatever they said were, fell on deaf ears. And if it was in writing, it may not have even been considered or read because they'd already predetermined that the outcome would be a dismissal. Um, so the, the ability to to um, be involved uh, in that to the sense of, of, of evening up the score, that once 
once they get in to us, that we can then start to deal with the... And, and say to them, you don't have to worry about this anymore. You've transferred that worry to us. We will um, apply all the necessary procedures so that you eventually get uh, an outcome which is just for you. So that, I think that's the way we can... Um, and, and in the end, um, you know, it is a, hopefully an even playing field once we get into the, the actual arena, uh, although the resources often behind the employer are huge and the law firms that we go up against are huge, um, we still manage to uh, you know, punch them out of our own weight. Because um, mm. I take it you're not particularly popular amongst these bigger companies and you probably made a bit of a name for yourself and when they see your name on the um you know on the whatever you call it the form that yeah, they the form. that they receive um do, do you think there's a little bit of a um gee we've got <laughs> we've got um a bit to deal with when they see your name on there is that do you think there's a bit of that now at this point well i think the the i do have a lot of friends um in in the bigger firms who who um we have conversations with behind the scenes and I, I think there is a an understanding that I'm not going to be pushed away. We're not going to be mm. pushed away. We're claimed Australia. We'll stay in for the long haul. Yeah, there's a respect of what and they what understand you're that, say, that yeah. it's, it's not yeah. not going to be unless they can get realistic at conciliation. It is going to go to a hearing, um, and there's a lot of all those big firms who who you know throw a huge amount of resources at, at doing the hearings. Um, but we've established a reputation that we will still be there in the end. It will not, we will not be exhausted by uh, financial resources being inadequate. Um, we have models where we can accommodate, because most people who come to us who've been unfairly dismissed, the last thing they've got is a lot of cash to um, support mm. a big legal battle. So we have to structure our, our uh, fee structure to accommodate that, and we do quite successfully. And... Um, in the great majority of cases, that's always been uh, adequate to get us through and to run the gauntlet with the opposition. Mm. Okay, we're well, just on that then. What, what are some of the highlights you've had in your career? And it doesn't have to be in your career as work claims, by the way, but although I imagine it possibly is. <laughs> well, one of the great... Um, I, I'm glad you asked me that because you, you warned me in advance that that might come up. But yeah. thinking about that, one of my greatest uh, memories is appearing in the when I was working for the uh, SEC, as I said, yeah. I appeared uh, the, the company flew me to Melbourne and I appeared um, in the full bench of the Australian Industrial Arbitration Commission, mm -hmm. which was really the forerunner of the Fair Work Commission. And I remember that we were appealing, against a decision of an individual commissioner who, uh, and his name was Commissioner Voss, and he had made a decision uh, just, uh, ruling on certain conditions and pay levels for uh, the SEC staff. And um, they wanted to oppose that. And, and I, I was, I worked out of an office in, in Melbourne, one of the big law firms the SEC was involved with, got me in there and um, um, you know, I was all prepped up, took about a week prepara preparation and um, the argument went for probably a day, day and a half. Um, and I can't remember all of the members of the bench, but I do remember that um, uh, Mary Gordon was on the bench and she finished up being a High Court judge um, later on. So that, that was a really highlight in, in a fairly early career. And a lot of people at that stage did ask me, particularly in the political arena, um, you know, as your next move into politics. Of course, it wasn't. Um, mm. But it was... Uh, and, and the other reason that that has always uh, remained in my memory is that the following... When I got back to Perth and was in the office, I had a call from Commissioner Voss and I was quite taken aback that the receptionist said there's a gentleman called Commissioner Voss on the phone. 
And I thought, my goodness, maybe he's going to reprimand me for something I might have said in the full bench. Anyway, no, he was ringing to congratulate me. Um, he said, I, I read the transcript and um, I want to wish you well. I think um, you've done a really good job on uh, on, on my case. Because <laughs> you know, it was an appeal against what he'd yes. decided. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose I should tell the rest of the story, and that is that we lost the appeal, but it was still a good journey. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, there you go. So that was so that really was a, a work claims type uh, activity. Yeah, but a lot earlier. A lot know. earlier, yeah. and probably was a forerunner why I I blossomed into that later on. Mm. Um, the other, there's two other matters which are completely different. One was retrieving a child, a very young child, probably three or four, uh, on a warrant. Um, from a family court order. I was order. going to say, it was just when you were doing family law. Family court yep. order. Yeah. And uh, the husband had absconded with the child and we, the mother, of course, was absolutely distraught. And over, <coughs> over, excuse me, over a couple of weeks, um, we fought this battle and I remember going with the policeman. We, we'd located pretty sure where the father was with the child and we had to take the police with us and a young constable. And um, yeah, we went to the to the home and retrieved the policeman retrieved the child and gave him to me, <laughs> and I took a, this kid back to the office and handed it to the mother, mm. the little boy. Yeah, that was a pretty memorable occasion. And the other memorable occasion was appearing in the high court um, for a young man who had been uh, convicted of uh, breaking and entering. Uh, in an office in Gosnells and he had really been verbaled by the police. It was, you know, this is going back a long way and the police had sort of verbaled a confession out of him and a confession he didn't really, it wasn't truthful and he hadn't done the, the crime. Um, and I always remember that because um, I appeared in the High Court, I used to travel to Perth in those days, and the... Uh, State Crown Solicitor, as he then was, he became a judge, Kevin Parker, he appeared against me and he, um, um, at the end of the proceedings, he came over and said, uh, congratulations, you did a great job, a great, better than the, the guy that represented him originally. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we lost that appeal as well. Um, so but that was a high court. That, and that was, uh, yeah, we had to get leave to appeal to a high court and leave was always hard to get, particularly in a criminal matter. Yeah, no, I imagine so. Those days. But that yeah. was a, a significant um, event, yeah. Yeah, no, gee, that's, that's some great, some of them I didn't even know, so there you go, that's, that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you were, if you were to go back, with, are there things that you would do differently in your life, whether that be... Uh, professionally or or otherwise um, like so I guess another way of phrasing it if like if you were speaking to yourself when you were younger what, what's something you might tell yourself to now that you've got the experience and the, the knowledge that you have now look on the one level I, I think I would say I probably wouldn't do anything differently because uh, you know wisdom after the event being wise in hindsight is, is okay in theory um, but on the other hand, I think the question deserves the, the, the proper answer, and that is, uh, yes, I would do it differently. And I think the the touchstone of that would be to not to make rash judgments about responding to things or um, doing things which haven't been properly thought out. It's probably a bit, sounds like an excuse for past behaviours, but uh, I think that is the underscoring thing that I take away from life, and that is to to draw back, think about it, consider it, maybe take some more advice. I think perhaps I had a tendency to be my own advisor and so that'll be right, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so it's a more cautious, but whether you temper, whether you can temper that with a young person's ambition mm. to to be trailblazing and doing this and doing that, um, it's hard to know. But that would be my 
advice to a younger Patrick growing up in the suburbs of Redmond. Mm. There you go. And um, because I sort of say like it it takes, you know, it takes a life to get the experience, but then once you've got the experience, you've got nothing to use it for. Well, (laughs) except maybe to pass it on to others. Like yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is right. Um, But I do have a philosophy of, as you've probably noticed, um, of not retiring. Mm. Because I can't. I I can't. I, I think there is so much to do, so much more to do, and so much to learn, and so much to pass on. In a sense, mm. so yeah, I, I, I'd only retire if I was totally disabled from working. Mm. And even then, I don't think it'd be it'd stop you from getting up and maybe going to the full bench. <laughs> well, I'd, yeah, I'd like to be able to do that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There you go. So we're we're actually coming to the end of the episode, but um, uh, I wanted to close because um, I obviously did ask this question ahead of time, so you could think about it and everything like that. But um, what are some books that you would recommend um to our uh listeners or viewers and, and our audience um books that have had an impact on you that you would uh recommend well um uh, given the sort of background that i've got and i've just sort of briefly touched upon for you my first selection would be um the old man and the sea by ernest hemingway um, I read that probably at a fairly early age, um, probably in my early 20s, and it sort of um, gave me a view of um, determination, and but nevertheless um, the disappointments which might flow from achieving the goals that you set for yourself. Hemingway wrote in that about a very old fisherman who had dreamt his whole life of catching the big fish, that is the big marlin, off the coasts of Mexico. And um, he went out in his little boat and caught the big marlin and then had to struggle to get back to shore. And as he struggled and rowed, sharks slowly but surely ate away all of his marlin so that when he got to port, he had nothing but just bones. So the moral of that is that you've got to be very, very guarded and cautious about about your goals and protect them as best you can. And it was a very, very well written by Hemingway. Mm. My other recommendation, number two, um, is uh, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, um, American politician who aspired to be president but never made it, but had a, a very keen view and very, very determined view that climate change was going to affect the planet, uh, probably at a time when it was really not very well accepted, even in scientific circles, they had time to go to before they reached a point where they were scientifically able to back it. Um, but it's, um, yeah, a very, a very good good um, dissertation on, on climate change and the interaction between what we need to do and the political system and the will to achieve it, which we've now seen in, in governments now who are now you know, making that one of their platforms mm-hmm. um, in the recent election. And um, our own government has promised to get the um, emissions down. And the, the third recommendation would be The Resilient Shield, which is quite a modern book yeah. um, written by three authors, uh, all of whom were former SAS members uh, in Australia and um, that that talks about the way of um, dealing with with life and and business and professions and how you can rethink the determination to to achieve in the face of insurmountable odds. Um, I know they draw their their inspiration from military uh, experiences and military background and the great difficulties that face military personnel um, but that's very well written and um, can I have a fourth one? Yeah I think you you, yeah. Yeah, you missed one there so you, yeah please I'd love <laughs> I, to hear the fourth I jumped, one too. I jumped yeah, ahead yeah. because I thought Resilient yeah. Shield was important for your Agreed. audience but yeah, yeah. certainly The Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela 
uh, would be good reading because, you know, we all think that we're suffering um, problems in life, in business and family and at work and, uh, you know, in government against, you know, the system. But what Mandela went through and achieved in the end, um, and he showed such uh, grace and humility to the, when he was in, when he had reached the command with the black power, he could have utilised that power, but he didn't. He chose peace. And uh, that was a huge, uh, I think that's a huge lesson to learn from our own determinations and our own endeavours because you know, there's, in, in each of us there's that, that tendency to be aggressive and uh, you know, to achieve and to dominate. Mm. But I think the, the way that he um, endured what, 27 years of imprisonment under the apartheid regime but nevertheless was able to keep his mental strength come through it, achieve power, the ultimate power, but not use it for retribution against those who had caused that pain to him over mm. such a long time. So that's a good read. Yeah, excellent. And I would be really remiss if I didn't ask you this question. I wanted to know who have been the most influential or inspirational people uh, in your life. And, you know, that Nelson Mandela, by the sounds of it, might be one of those people, but perhaps even in you know, your own personal life as well. Uh, look, I think, well, the first, yeah, there's two features of that, I think, the, yeah. the, the overview of where you, you move in the world and, and see people yeah. and know people and perhaps meet people. Um, but my mother would have to be, um, I think, the great inspiration because she she came from a, a relatively poor background. Um, she married my father, who was a soldier, um, after she... She met him and married him. We went to the Second World War. Um, and so she she was a, basically a farmer with a, an education ending, I think, in probably our equivalent of year eight or nine, um, which was more than my father had. He, he ended about year six. So she was a, the academic in the family, basically. Mm. But she placed a great deal of store in education. Um, and I remember... We went to a Catholic school, a nun school, and it was we would carry a twenty cent piece, called a florin in those days. But that was the school fee that we had to take every Monday. And it, I didn't think about it at the time, but looking back, you'd think, well, that was probably a very, very hard to achieve. You know, money wasn't wasn't around like we bought groceries from a, a local store, which was the only store in the area, and we all he lived on credit we would book up our groceries for six months until the, the cheque came in from the milk factory and so mm. forth. So, but her, her, she was very ambitious and um, uh, encouraged education, education. They can never take education from you. And, um, of course, had great, great plans for, for my future. But um, So I think she was a great inspiration to me. And I think... My children, because they taught me humility. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, I want to say thanks for coming on, and I feel like there's loads of stories we could, we could dive dive into, um, and I think we'll have to get you back on if if you'd be willing to come back on. That is, I hope you will. Um, uh, but before we do, um, as far as work claims, how can people find out about you or get in touch with you if, if they're looking to, to do so? Well, thanks to Wizzica Media, we do have a very good website. and uh, oh, so that's, well, I didn't make the website, but I, I have you've, there's some you've, videos on there. Yeah, you've certainly uh, contributed <laughs> yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, I think the website is probably the, the best, workclaimsaustralia.com, um, and there's a phone connection there. And, yeah, we're very happy to talk on the phone give advice on the phone and get things moving if we need to. Excellent. All right. So I want to thank you again for coming on and look forward to seeing you back on the podcast podcast soon. Oh, I'd love to do that. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure and a privilege. <laughs>